Okay, we are live now. So if you're ready, you can get started. Okay. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Arya Kulkarni from T1B Dark Matter. First of all, I would like to appreciate the efforts of Naksatra team for arranging this beautiful course, informative lectures, and assigning interesting projects. Uh, thank you for providing the Equinox platform and boosting our journey towards the astronomy and astrophysics. Today we are going to present LCDM and MOND, success and limitations topic. Uh, in this topic, we have studied the basics of LCDM and MOND theories, limitations of these theories. Rather than just supporting or opposing the dark matter existence, we have studied the part where both the theories are unable to explain the nature like the mysterious galaxies. These are the names of team members of T1B Dark Matter. Thank you everyone for the active participation and thank you Sagarika for the guidance. Moving to the overview of the presentation, it will include the presentation about uh, LCDM, MOND, then failure of MOND and LCDM mysterious galaxies and then dark matter superfluidity. Now, uh, we are going to present the LCDM uh, model. The flow of LCDM presentation will be introduction to cosmological model, accelerated expansion of the universe, understanding redshifts, dark matter candidates, standard cosmological model, and then limitations of the LCDM. So moving to the cosmological models, uh, Cosmological models are basically the mathematical description of universe that tries to explain the current behavior of universe and its evolution over the time. The main principles of cosmology are homogeneity, so uh, homogeneity, isotropy, and Hubble's law. So first one is the homogeneity. Homogeneity states that there is no preferred location in the universe and basically it deals with the con conservation of the linear momentum. Second one is the isotropy. Isotropy states that there is no preferred direction in the universe, uh, which actually deals with the conservation of angular momentum. And third one is the Hubble's law. So basically Hubble's law explains about the expansion of universe. Now Supratim is going to present the Hubble's law and accelerated expansion of the universe. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. Yeah, good evening everyone. I am Supratim from Team 1B Dark Matter. And as accelerated expansion of universe, as universe is not expanding in a constant way, as it is in accelerated manner. As you can see here, uh, the left hand side cartoon, it's the like universe is expanding because it's inhaling like that. So as Einstein predicted that the universe is expanding in static manner, but later it was observed that it's accelerated as I said earlier. In account to prove this, astronomers first measured the radial velocity of the nebula and found velocity distance relationship. Now later they found that spiral nebulas are anonymously running away from us and as greater as the distance, the greater the recession and it is receding with time. This shows the speed is proportional to the distance. So next slide, sorry. Yeah. Here the, then comes the lemmeter, means the parameter prediction. Due to the expansion of the universe, the galaxies move away from us with the velocity of v proportional to distance l, that relation later known as Hubble's law. As you can see, v is equal to h l, where the value of the Hubble parameter as given by lemmeter was h is equal to 192 kilometer per second per million light year. Now, uh, next slide. Yeah, yeah, describing the universe is expanding with some consideration. As you can see the figure, the point O in the center represents the theoretical point of the space where the Big Bang would be happened. It is uh, certainly different from the point where the observer of the Earth is placed, say OT or OT dash, you can see there in the second quadrant. 
the lemmeter law claims that the speed of the galaxy is directly proportional to distance that theoretically would have to be the distance of the galaxy with respect to the effective and unknowable point in which the initial big bang would be happened in actually instead the distance is considered with respect to space position of the observer that is uh, distance has the physical meaning so the graphical representation shows uh, for instance the respect to the hypothetical position o of the big bang the distance of the galaxy 3 is greater than the distance of galaxy 5 as you can see the galaxy 3 is uh, in the outermost orbit and uh, well, you know, galaxy v5 is in the uh, means uh, inner of that part in the second circle you can see so it follows that as per the lemmeter law the speed v3 of the galaxy 3 is greater than the speed v5 of the galaxy 5 with respect to the position of ot dash as the observer is that ot dash the distance of the galaxy 3 is smaller than the distance of galaxy 5 as you can show that the dotted lines are represent that from ot dash the point of v v3 is lesser than the point of v5 so so in that case the for the lemmeter law would affirm that the speed of the galaxy 3 is smaller than the speed of the galaxy 5 as the calculation of the distance of galaxy is therefore the critical point for the lemmeter law it follows that the whole theory of the expansion of the universe and of the big bang presents numerous critical points and from from the theoretical point of view and also the experimental point of view but it's only a hypothesis on the origin on the evolution of the universe as the expansion of the universe is thought have been accelerated since the universe entered in dark energy dominated era roughly about 5 billion years ago uh, within the frame of the general relativity and accelerator expansion can be accounted by a positive value of the cosmological constant lambda and equivalent to the presence of the positive energy that dark energy now i come to hubble next slide so the hubble's observation as you can see in the figure as first the astronomers observed a single nebula and found its speed to be like from the speed distance relationship and a speed to be 300 km per second then eddington measured 90 more nebula and plot a graph as shown by the dotted line as you can see in the graph are you yeah as you can see in the dotted lines in the graph and then hubble's come into picture and he observed more and found the average velocity of nebulas are about uh, 500 km per second and then hubble corrected the graph as shown by the solid line as, as you can see the solid line so as you can see the maximum number of nebulas are located near the solid line and that's the correct the, it shows the correct figure and hubble observed the shifts of the wavelength of the spectral lines the spectral lines were shifted towards the longer wavelength for the most of the nebulas which was called as the cosmic redshift now the redshift part is been explained by renuka thank you Yeah. Thanks, Supratim. Hi, everyone. This is Renuka, and I'll uh, quickly walk you all through the concept of redshift and what causes it. Okay, let's start with a very basic question: What basically redshift is? It is a phenomenon that occurs when the light that is emitted or reflected from an object is shifted towards the less energetic, that is, the higher wavelength end of the spectrum. The perceived light won't be necessarily red. Instead, the term redshift. refers to the human perception of longer wavelengths as red redshifting concept is really important otherwise we would perceive a gamma ray as an x ray and a visible light as radio waves this phenomenon is really helpful to us in understanding features of a galaxy and even of the universe as a whole as shown in the given formula redshift may be characterized by the relative difference between the observed and emitted wavelengths of an object this change is referred by using a dimensionless quantity is it so if this value is lesser than 0 then the light is said to be blue shifted and if this value is greater than 0 then the light gets red shifted next slide yeah now let's see how redshift proves expansion of universe initially it was believed that redshift is due to the doppler effect which says that if a wave emitting object moves towards you there is less space between the wave crest you receive and therefore the frequencies you observe are shifted towards higher values than the emitted frequencies 
Similarly, when an emitter moves away from you, there is more space between the crest and therefore your observed frequencies are shifted towards longer values. But in 1929, Hedwin Abel observed that light from distant galaxies appeared redder than it would normally be expected. Hubble concluded that the photons get increased in wavelength and redshifted as the space through which they are traveling expands, which is called as cosmological redshift. In fact, it was one of the first pieces of evidence for the Big Bang Theory. It is apparent from the graph that there is nearly linear relationship between distance and velocity. As the universe expands, light is stretched as well, increasing its wavelength and losing energy. This is the equation representing the famous Hubble's law where H0 is called Hubble's parameter. So this uh, the expansion of universe is uh, primarily responsible for the redshifting we see of distant galaxies. Next slide please. Now there comes the question, what else could possibly create redshift? We find that light gets affected on its journey through the universe in many ways. And one alternative was tired light scenario. So it was uh, this concept was first proposed in 1929 by Fritz Zwicky, who suggested that photons lose energy over time via interaction with matter or other photons. One of the successes of this theory was that it predicted the cosmic background radiation temperature to be around 2.8 degree Kelvin. And some of the remaining problems with the tired light theories is the Physical processes through which the energy loss of the photons is brought about is not identified yet and the lack of increased blurring at greater distances. The possibility would be gravitational lensing. The fabric of space isn't just expanding, it is also curved by the presence of matter and energy within the universe. This curvature means that the distance between any two points is not a straight and unbroken line rather is a curved path through space, what you call a geodesic. Depending on how much space is covered by, this can delay the arrival of the light by significant amounts over time, meaning that the light has to travel for longer than it would otherwise through the expanding universe. That additional time delay means that the light experiences an additional redshift. General relativity demands that this effect exists even if our astronomical equipment isn't yet advanced enough to detect it. The next scenario would be interactions with matter. Yeah, uh, The universe is mostly empty space, but matter still exists. When light passes through matter where it can interact with charged particles, electrons in particular, some of that light will get boosted to higher energies where it won't be observed anymore shifting the spectrum of that light. It plays only a very minor role in practice, but it is a very real effect. Moving on, uh, we have gravitational redshift. Yeah, the light from the massive object has to climb out of the gravitational potential created by the object's mass. Since light can't slow down, it always moves at the speed of light. That means it has to lose energy to reach interstellar or intergalactic space. Similarly, before that, light arrives at our eyes, it has to fall into the gravitational potential of our local group and our galaxy and our solar system, causing an energy gain and a blue shift. All of the cases we discussed till now affects the light's frequency. All of this impacts the light that travels through space, not by altering its speed, rather they alter the path that light travels and the wavelength the light possesses. And that all makes the difference. Although astronomers cannot see dark matter, they can detect its influence in gravitational lensing, which is primarily responsible uh, for redshift. Now we have Sayanthan from our team to explain us about dark matter candidates. Over to Sayanthan. Thank you. Thank you, Renuka. Now I am audible. Hello, I am audible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. So I am going to discuss about the dark matter candidates. So uh, till now, what we know about the, so uh, we are discussing about the lambda CD. So we know about the big, uh, big conception about the lambda. So I'm going to about the uh, discuss about the cold dark matter. So first of all, to know the dark matter properties, that, that should, we should know about the candidates because the candidates are something which carry the properties of dark matter. Okay. So our universe mainly contains of baryonic matters, which is the visible uh, to us. So by definition, baryonic matter should only include matter composed of baryons. In other words, it should include proton, neutrons, 
and all the objects composed of them. Astronomers use the term baryonic to refer to all the objects made of normal atomic matter. So now why the non-baryonic matters comes? Well, for nothing, the same theories that predict the abundance of baryonic matter, Big Bang nuclear synthesis, they along with the observation and formation theories of galaxy clusters also predict the existence of non-baryonic matter. And we know that the amount of matter needed to hold the clusters of galaxy is about 10 times the amount of baryonic matter. So if uh, dark matter is not made of baryonic matter, another option is that it consists of not cyprogenic, it is the non-baryonic matter. So what is non-baryonic matter? The non-baryonic matter is a hypothetical form of matter that is not containing the baryon. The next, so in this uh, non-baryonic matter that comes uh, with, with respect with the basis of particle speed with respect to the speed of light that comes three types of mainly uh, dark, dark matter uh, candidates uh, like CDM, HDM and WDM. What is CDM? Though we are uh, discussed about the lambda CDM, model, so we know basic about the CDM. So on this basis of the particle speed, uh, the particles in the category have substantially massive and move at the sub relativistic speed. So far less than the speed of the light at the epoch of radiation of matter equality. And it is applicable in the large scale structure like, like the categories in this categories, OEMs, matches, axioms are come. And the, similarly, HDM also the particles that have moved zero and near uh, near zero mass, and the uh, WDM is between those. Okay, now come at the OEMs. OEMs is uh, seen that at the weakly interacting massive particles called the OEMs. Uh, OEMs are a form of CDM, and as the name implies, they interact only weakly with the ordinary matter. And also, massive means have sufficient mass, like the heavy neutrinos, neutralinos, axion, etc. Then I come on these OEMs categories uh, like neutralino. What a neutralino are the massive hypothetical particles heavier and slower than neutrinos. It comes essentially in the mainly in the uh, supersymmetric theory. Okay, and uh, according to the supersymmetric theory, all the particles have their super partner. And similarly, the neutrino also neutrino the super partner of uh, several particles, and is currently a very popular cold argument candidate. And like the comes the axions, it's also another candidate for non-baryonic uh, dark matter. And uh, the existence uh, has been invented to solve a, a theoretical problem in particle physics, well uh, from cosmology, but uh, which is called the CP symmetric problem in quantum chromodynamics. So they are uh, they are the theorized particle, but if they exist, uh, they are very light with a massive meter of 10 to the minus 30 to 10 to the minus 60. Then come into this matrix, this massive compact halo of this. Maybe dark matter also exists within the uh, dark halos of galaxy, but if halo of dark uh, halo in this halo dark matter exists in the form of matrix, it should be possible to detect their existence uh, by the uh, gravitational lensing of star images. The next <clears throat> the experiment, though uh, though there are uh, all hypothetical particles, that is all the theorized. So scientists thought that if then they, if they found their existence then they will be uh, sure about them. So they, they are trying to detect them. So how they detect, uh, try to detect? They detect the energy uh, deposited, uh, deposited from the dark matter interaction. This energy are very small. So uh, for this, uh, we should, uh, we should uh, lace the background effect like cosmic background, uh, cosmic radiation. And, and, uh, and we, should, uh, we should make this apparatus extremely sensitive detectors. And uh, the dark matter interaction rate in current experiments each uh, expected to be maybe a few per year. So lots of patients also required for these experiments. Next. Then uh, there are uh, some experiments uh, the super CDM models, and uh, this is also put in undergone due to uh, due to less the um, to decrease the cosmic uh, cosmic uh, uh, cosmic radiation, and that's uh, like CDMs to the southern. It is also very low temperature, 50 millikelvin base, and strong level of 15 millikelvin. And uh, there are some um, uh, experiments like LNGS zero ninety one D, where zero is used as a target. And there are also uh, a um, LZ, LZ experiment is going on. The LZ collaboration has published results showing the re radioactive background levels for experiments components, creating a, a library for uh, future uh, rare event research. Okay, then next.
then uh, there comes the uh, like same uh, experiment like uh, super uh, camera and experiment uh, which to detect the need to remain the sterile need to know uh, uh, sorry in the need to know uh, using the uh, pure water as need to know net and in ice cube uh, which is situated at a south pole also try to detect in the sterile uh, need to know and they are uh, similar like uh, dama experiment which is also going on in italy and there are uh, some space based uh, uh, experimentals going on uh, in uh, ams uh, which is also set up in iss uh, and fgst uh, farmi um, farmi kamare uh, searching telescope and his telescope also there this is a down based telescope and the next then uh, then the uh, uh, lsst which is lsst it, it, in just a few years a scientist at a, at verasi rubin observatory you all know the, about the verasi rubin the first woman who is uh, come to uh, come to know about the dark matter and uh, he study about the andromeda galaxy and um, uh, after his name the uh, a observatory found in uh, in chile his name is verasi rubin and uh, scientists are try to uh, launch a the legacy survey of space and time lsst using the uh, world's biggest digital camera for uh, for ground based astronomy to take the most detailed pictures of the night sky ever made and when they do uh, two of the most important things they will look for uh, dark matter and uh, dark energy and try to uh, mysterious try to uh, uh, mysterious invisible substance that make up about 95% of our universe okay then next now comes the dark distortion you know uh, visualizing dark matter is not an easy task okay and all the scientists have reason to believe that a mysterious substance makes up about 27% of all the matter and energy in the universe they still have yet to see it directly they only know it exists because of its gravitational pull on the visible matter so what dark distortion is dark distortion is nothing but an, an art installation at the science gallery dublin uh, which aims to tackle the unseeable nature of dark matter by combining the power of art and science which is also is collaboration with uh, esa and it's a it's a sculpture that takes up about 10 square feet it designed to mimic the twist in motion of light as it passes through the dark matter okay then there is a video uh, aria you can start about this dark distortion Now stop this and next slide. But in uh, but you know in uh, reality this distortion are 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 uh, so tiny that uh, that you have to barely notice them, which is why you need a telescope light Euclid. Uh, Euclid that can make enormous maps of the sky. The Euclid mission will investigate a dark matter, dark energy, and evolution in history of the universe by looking at the gravitational lensing and other cosmological phenomena. It will be launched within the two, uh, within uh, two zero two two. Okay. The next. but uh, why do we do those experiments 
mainly uh, scientists uh, had uh, tried to uh, became, we became we became fascinated about the about uh, that is there a really something that we uh, we are not able to see but they affect our universe so uh, scientists are uh, scientists are doing uh, with their fascination that uh, to detect the, to discover the dark matter and uh, incredibly difficult but it is incredibly difficult to make and uh, make um, make a detector to detect this so uh, there are also counts the ch challenging detector technology and uh, uh, they they uh, try to make uh, build, uh, build the new detectors and uh, make them work okay and there are also some interesting places to work like underground underground, underground mines and south poles uh, iss are a really interesting place and there are also fermi lab and um, there are also um, uh, 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 lhc which are very very interesting places but though that till now uh, they are not de uh, they are not able to detect uh, any such type of particles but uh, uh, this all these things are uh, boosting them to uh, to try to uh, go on uh, forward okay the next Yes, uh, you all know uh, he is an, an, an famous astronomer and uh, is quite, is very, very famous quite. The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence of Carl Sagan's uh, famous quote, who is uh, also boost every scientist to uh, try to detect this dark matter and, and say, saying people about the uh, new things. This is also a really fun type of experience going on. Okay, thank you. Now I will stop and then Arya will go with the uh, standard cosmological model. Uh, thank you, Sayanta. We have seen the basics of Hubble's law, expanding universe, various reasons of redshifting of wavelength and dark matter candidates. Now let's move to the standard model of Big Bang cosmology. Which is also called as LCDM, that is Lambda Cold Dark Matter Cosmological Model. The very uh, the two observable parameters that can constrain the physical properties of universe are mass density and rate of expansion, which is also called as Hubble's parameter. So the estimated value of Hubble's parameter is 60 to 70 kilometer per sec per megaparsec, and uh, the mass density can be defined as the ratio of amount of matter in the universe to that required to hold the uh, the observed expansion of the galaxies. Now if the mass of density is greater than one. That means enough matter is present to stop expansion of the universe and eventually which will lead to the big crunch. So this type of universe is called as closed universe. Now, if the mass density is less than one, then that type of universe is called as open universe. So universe will always overcome the force of gravity and expansion will continue forever. Now, the uh, last condition is uh, mass density is exactly equal to one. Type of, uh, this type of universe is called as flat universe or critical universe. This is the balance between infinite expansion and uh, eventual collapse uh, or the big crunch. Now, as per the cosmic microwave background observations, uh, flat universe is there with exact omega is equal to one, that is mass density is equal to exact one. But uh, the measured abundances of light elements were only consistent with the calculations of Big Bang nucleosynthesis if uh, normal matter that is uh, luminous matter is amounted on to 5% of mass density. So remaining 95% is the dark matter and dark energy. Now the observable evidences uh, of the uh, dark matter are as follows. Uh, first one is the galaxy clusters. So uh, as per the relation between average kinetic energy of a system to its potential kinetic energy, uh, it denotes that the mass due to luminous matter is not sufficient to keep the clusters bound together. So dark matter must be present there to hold the galaxy clusters. Uh, the second one is galactic curves. Uh, as per the uh, standard Newtonian dynamics, velocity of stars should reduce or decrease as we move towards the edges of the galaxy, uh, but it remains constant. This suggests that mass of galaxy must not be entirely defined by the objects uh, that we can see. So if we consider the halos of dark matter beyond the edges of luminous matter, the galactic curves can be explained well. Next one is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, the cosmic microwave background 
is the effect or the uh, effect of the competition between major two forces first is the force of gravity uh, that causes matter to fall inside or the invert and second one is the uh, outward pressure externally ex exerted by the uh, photon the existence of dark matter can be observed by cosmic microwave background observation as it uh, clumps in the dense regions and contributes to gravitational collapse of matter uh, but it's unaffected by the uh, pressure of the photon now the last one is the bullet cluster so bullet cluster is basically uh, formed because of the high speed collision of two galaxy clusters uh, there are the two type of matters uh, which can be observed the first one is the optically visible matter that lead to concentration of mass near the center of the uh, cluster but uh, another matter another observation uh, because of the gravitational lensing shows that matter outside of matter is present at the center as well as matter is outside of the luminous matter as well which leads to the dark matter existence now namita will explain the limitations thank you arya so i hope i am audible uh, so uh, so far we said uh, that lcdm model was successful in explaining the observed phenomenon but what happens is this is uh, what lcdm is predicting that is consistent with the model predictions at larger scales so when it comes to smaller scales lcdm model is actually getting challenged to explain what the observations are and there are some deviations from these predictions so it is having a challenge to explain how these deviations are present so this is what i have mentioned there as small scale crisis that is within a few mega parsec within our local group and further lcdm is actually having a challenge to predict like to explain the observations and the deviations from its predictions so uh, to say a few uh, there are many popular deviations of lcdm predictions and observations that is there so one of them is a missing satellite problem so that is uh, we are observing very much lesser number of dwarf galaxies than what is actually predicted by lcdm model so for example uh, actually there are around 400 to 500 dwarf galaxies that are actually predicted around our milky way alone by through the dark matter simulations and theories but uh, what actually we are observing is around 40 to 50 dwarf galaxies in the whole local group so there is a huge discrepancy between what is actually predicted and what we are actually observing so this is actually a very huge challenge that lcdm is trying to like explain through the uh, models and uh, theories so another very popular uh, problem is the core cusp problem so what it says is uh, in low mass galaxies the prediction of density profiles and their observations results it is having a very huge discrepancy so when dark matter simulations are made uh, when dark matter simulations are made we find that a uh, dark matter halos are formed with density increasing steeply at smaller radius but observations show that these galaxies are having a rather uh, very flat density profiles towards the center so this is actually very much um, contradicting what we are actually predicting through lcdm so these are and there are several other problems like this which uh, lcdm is actually trying to um, explain but it is having a challenge so um, when we are trying to explain there are several potential solutions that we are predicting so that is uh, for example milky way satellite mi uh, missing satellite problem what we actually say is the small dark matter clumps would have been made or unable to obtain enough ba baryonic matter to form stars or they were unable to retain what they had like formed or obtained or uh, these small galaxies when they were made they were quickly very quickly eaten up by the larger galaxies around which they orbit so a very few of them end up as a visible galaxy or very few of them we are actually able to observe them the others were actually gone into the the larger galaxy around which they orbit so uh, if we have if we can find a very few very faint and ultra faint galaxies we will be able to actually say what has happened there or the but the major challenge here is to observe them like we can't um without very high technology and very deep very high resolution simulations we can't actually predict what happened to these missing galaxies they would have taken eaten up by the larger galaxies but 
it is very difficult to trace them through the simulations and go by going back in time so there are many there are such many challenges that lcdm face in this manner and the major one is the including the dark matter particles we are not still able to not detect the dark matter particles even though we have the influences that we are observing we still don't know what the dark matter particles are or what they are made of what are the mechanisms they have other than the gravitational interactions so these questions actually needs to be explained to have a proper uh, substantial revision and understanding of this uh, lcdm so uh, the potential solutions that we are actually um, predicting is uh, having a future surveys to have discover this such very faint and ultra faint distant dwarf galaxies and to precisely measure their masses and their density structures and so that we can actually try to understand what is happening in our milky way or around our milky way and in our local group and in such small scales so this will be a very huge addition to uh, support or make um, like needed changes to the lcdm model and also we should be able to have programs observational programs to constrain discover and characterize the dark matter halos and we should be able to have very high resolution simulations and um, technologies to actually predict and understand our local group and the small scales where this lcdm model should be able to predict what we are actually observing so such efforts can actually verify the lcdm model or we can have substantial revisions to that so thank you now over to mont okay so uh, thank you uh, for lcdm team uh, it was a really wonderful presentation uh, and a very good evening to all of you my name is vij bramabhat and i am going to be talking about mond today so mond is actually modified newtonian dynamics so we are going to be covering this this uh, covering what is exactly mond how much accurate is mond what is the tully fisher relations and what are the limitations of mond next slide please so this was like a really uh, famous quote from richard feynman and he said that we are trying to prove ourselves wrong as fast as possible because that's how we make progress and it's very self explanatory uh, lcdm uh, is imperfect and we need a new theory which is able to explain nicely uh, which what whatever lcdm is not able to explain it correctly so moving on okay so earlier you might have noticed that there was this graph which was showing it was the velocity graph which was showing some offset in uh while you were going away from the center of the galaxy and it was like increasing so this rotational mass curve mass discrepancy led to two conclusions so the first conclusion was uh for requirement for more velocity you required more mass so if it had more mass and if we, we were not able to detect it then we called it dark matter so that led us to the dark matter theory but some people were also asking the question that what if newton's wrong what if newtonian dynamics doesn't work in galaxy properly so that leads leads us to mond theory moving on okay so this is the schematic diagram of how exactly mond works it is like a totally basic mond and i'm going to be summarizing it so this is our galaxy sorry about the bad drawing but uh, this is our galaxy and from the center and moving outwards the radius is increasing and in the internal region there is high acceleration in the internal region of the circle uh, it represents the high acceleration and this high acceleration is what is is where newtonian dynamics work perfectly and this is known as a uh, newtonian regime but as uh, you go away from the center as you increase the radius the acceleration decreases and because of this decrease in acceleration when you go beyond a certain acceleration and that is known as a not which we call it as 
the acceleration constant so if you go beyond it newton's law should not work newton's dynamics don't work and this region where newton's dynamics don't work this is known as de point regime and that is how exactly it had been theorized so moving on okay so this is uh, a like summarizing the differences between the two so the solid curve represents the mond uh, the mond dynamics and the dashed curve the dashed curve represents the newtonian uh, dynamics and the horizontal curve the red horizontal curve is the limit the acceleration constant and you can see that below the acceleration constant both of this um, curves they converge meaning that it just reduces to the newtonian dynamics mond but as soon as it reaches like below like beyond the acceleration constant you can see that it is diverging so this is kind of showing an asymptotic nature next slide please okay so uh, this uh, mass discrepancy as we say is also a measure by eta so eta is basically the ratio of the actual gravitational acceleration to the newtonian gravitational acceleration so uh, this is what uh, is this is what shows the mass discrepancy and how different how different it gets from the actual value how different the gravitational acceleration from the newtonian calculations is different from the actual gravitational acceleration so the, you see in the top left there's a graph so this is the graph for the ratio which is the mass discrepancy against the radius and you might be able to faintly see a line a blue line so this blue line is actually your uh, acceleration constant and beyond it the, these dots represent all the stars and you can see that this is totally random it makes no sense there is no pattern at all but below the graph this graph is the uh, the mass discrepancy ratio against the newtonian gravitation acceleration and you can see clearly that it is giving you a really nice curve and this curve is showing asymptotic nature and uh, it's this actually observed this observational data had already been predicted by modhai milgram in 1983 and uh, it's a really nice uh, representation really nice observational cons confirmation so yeah uh, next slide please okay so the mond acceleration that i just talked about the acceleration constant is actually related to hubble's and cosmological constants so this uh, uh, actually the a not is approximately equal to this speed of light into h not this h not is actually the hubble's constant and is also approximately equal to c square to the half of lambda by 3 where lambda represents the cosmological constant okay moving on okay so let's talk about speeds so speeds in mondian regime deep mond regime uh, velocity is independent in the deep mond regime it is independent of the radius in the deep mond regime it is totally dependent upon the mass so i really don't want to go into detail about the uh, relations but this is the related this is related with the mass and this mass is kind of standard mass used in mond and a not as well this uh, relation in the below that is given that m to the power of fourth power of m times a not these are a kind of like standard values so i'm not going to be talking too much in detail about this uh, so moving on okay so galaxies in a summary so i already talked about this in my uh, previous section so g here g is the actual actual gravitational acceleration and it is equal to the newtonian gravitational acceleration times a, an interpolating function which is a function of g by a not and at high accelerations g is very very greater than a not and the interpolation function is just reduces to one and the, this reduces to newtonian regime 
as predicted by Mond, as how Mond had been theorized. And if you talk about low accelerations, G is really, really small, and it leads to that the interpolation function reaches some value. This is uh, G by A naught. I, I suppose the graph that you saw from the graph, it represents this value. And this is where deep point regime comes. And here, where G is approximately equal to the half square root of uh, G n by A naught. And G n, as I already told you, is the Newtonian gravitation. Uh, moving on. Okay, so this is the graph. I have already talked about this as well. So the solid curve represents the uh, Mond curve. And you can clearly see that this is representing a clear cut. This is giving you a clear cut uh, fitting for every type of galaxies. Uh, there are also exceptions, but these types of galaxies are spiral and they're circular. And you can see that it's perfectly, almost perfectly showing, fitting the observational data. And it's really, really nice. Moving on. Okay, so Mond also predicts the baryonic content in the galaxy. So as a uh, Mond shows you a particular rotational curve that had been predicted for a particular galaxy and is able to also find the baryonic content from that data. But uh, if I talk about uh, dark matter theory, dark matter theory, uh, it is really quite difficult to uh, plot rotational curves using dark matter theory because uh, dark matter theory is totally dependent upon the history of the galaxy, how the galaxy has been evolved. It depends from all these types of uh, all these types of uh, yeah, you know relations, and it requires to knowing the how they form the galaxies, and because it's probably impossible to know this because you have to go back in time and uh, like how exactly did the galaxy form? So it is not able to even predict the baryonic content of the galaxy. Okay, and one just predicts from its basic from its basic formulas, from the very basic formulas. Okay, moving on. Okay, so how do you exactly test one? So uh, you require the actual gravitational acceleration to be less than the acceleration constant. Because if it isn't the case, then it is totally useless. Because if the gravitational acceleration is too high, then that just represents that you are testing Newtonian regime, as I already talked. As I already said earlier, that it is totally reduces to Newtonian uh, regime, and you would not be using Mond at all. Uh, so that's why you require less acceleration, and then you use Mond, and it resolves the mass discrepancy, and then you check with the observational data. You check the velocity dispersions in the observational data, and if it fits perfectly, you can match them. You 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 can see the how it perfectly matches, and then you're all good. It works really nicely. That's and that's really simple how Mond works, you know? It's totally classical. Okay, moving on. So uh, we're talking about the elliptical galaxies. So whatever I talked about earlier, that all of that was applicable to spiral galaxies, which were, which were having components or let's just probes like stars and all, they were rotating in a uh, around the center in a circular orbit. But in, in case of the elliptical orbits, it is quite difficult. Why? Because the first reason is that it is quite difficult to predict the Mond regime itself. It is difficult to know where exactly the acceleration is low in elliptical galaxies. And it is the other, uh, problem that would occur is that uh, you require the whatever the components of the elliptical galaxies are, for example, the probes that I just talked about, like stars, globular clusters, and planetary nebulas, their orbits, they are totally unknown orbits. So they don't have, we cannot say for sure that it is like a completely a circular orbits, and that leads to uncertainties. And uh, earlier, uh, I suppose that even a dark matter group people uh, said that this was an exception, but actually strong gravitational lensing is only able to detect high accelerations where Mond cannot be tested because that is totally useless. 
you know because high acceleration region is you testing just newtonian dynamics and mond cannot be tested there as there were like as there was like quite of quite a lot of controversies and people were like what mond doesn't work here it's wrong but it's not the case uh, because strong gravitational lensing only is able to detect high acceleration and but by the way a very recent result shows that people were also using with correct stellar dy dynamics stellar dynamics that and they also used uh, strong gravitational lensing they said uh, they predicted that bond is working really nicely with their data and however uh, this recent study showed that it is pretty consistent with observed dynamics of isolated ellipticals yes so isolated ellipticals is a type of a rare or let's say this exception that it works in bond because uh you're fairly uh you're vaguely able to predict the velocities of the stars by using the root mean square velocities and you can see this graph uh these isolated ellipticals and this graph here the solid curve represents the bond and you can see that the tiny dots are really close to it meaning that it works really fine it's like totally consistent with the data also okay now i'm going to be talking about the dwarf spheroidal galaxies so a dwarf spheroidal galaxy is not the galaxy like at the size of milky way you know it's a really small as the name suggests it's dwarf meaning that it's really small and it has quite a number the quite a number of galaxies are uh, in our milky way and andromeda galaxies itself and these are in spheroidal shapes meaning that uh, you know like a perfect sphere but it is squished this squished shape of a sphere is known as a spheroidal shape and this is what dwarf spheroidal galaxies look like and what is a really really nice thing about dwarf spheroidal galaxies is that these dwarf spheroidal galaxies have i are like in a very low acceleration region and they are perfect for testing bond and and like they are like as the observational data shows as well mond is able to like perfectly fabulously predict uh, the dwarf spheroidal discrepancies the mass discrepancies it was able to almost perfectly fabulously find the mass discrepancies and all of the information that mond used was only gravity and it no, it did not use D, dm or dark matter at all okay moving on okay so this is the main i would say like the most hyped topic so dm versus mond test for dwarf for tidal dwarf galaxies uh so tidal dwarf galaxies are a specific type of galaxies and uh basically these dwarf galaxies it has been suggested from the recent studies that these tidal dwarf galaxies had been formed because of the past interactions of the parent galaxies that they are in for example if we talk about milky way galaxies and the andromeda galaxies uh, whatever the tidal dwarf galaxies we see right now they are because of the interactions of between the andromeda and milky way galaxy and uh, what happened was that the dwarf spheroidal galaxies in milky way they uh, because of the interaction these dwarf spheroidal galaxies changed into tidal dwarf galaxies so in this diagram you see uh, this is the spiral arm of the galaxy and you see these tiny circles these tiny circles are actually tdgs meaning they they are tidal dwarf galaxies and this is a really special this is i'm going to be like explaining to you why this is really special so actually uh, if i talk about lcdm lcd does not work at all is not able to explain at all why this is happening so uh, actually the uh, yes so lcdm says that there should be no dark matter in the tidal dwarf galaxies meaning that there should be no uh, there should be no relation for any mass discrepancies in the tidal dwarf galaxies and it also says that there should be of totally primordial origin meaning that they were existed since the early universe meaning they were 
they were there already but uh, this is not what we see because as i already talked about it is because of the interaction and if it weren't primordial then you wouldn't be seeing these uh, this spiral arms in like this dots this they wouldn't be at the spiral arms you would be seeing a more like a random distribution but it's not the case and and also there were like quite a lot of examples that tidal dwarf galaxies did exhibit mass discrepancies but some of them were ruled out because they weren't in virial equilibrium but mond uh, i mean mond does not depend on any of the historical relations mond just predicts wherever the low low very low acceleration regions are so this uh, these tidal dwarf galaxies are in like very low acceleration regions and uh, because of this they are able to predict clear cut like explanation for this tidal uh, why this tidal discrepancy occurred you know uh, because they just follow their own basic formula okay next next slide yeah uh, next slide please this is all bit already been covered okay so the falsification of standard model of cosmology so professor pavel krupa is actually uh, it has really research in this uh, mond and quite a lot of research background he has in mond and he has quite worked quite a lot with the creator of mond himself modi milgram he told me that just for my end of information in case if i'm not aware the standard model of cosmology is now falsified by more than seven sigma confidence and they are completely ruled out if the tests reach beyond five sigma confidence okay so let me try to explain what is going what is going on here so whatever the theory you have in physics for it to be true whatever the predictions it has they have to be matched they have to be true with the observational data till five sigma confidence if it's not the case then it's ruled out and uh, standard model of cosmology has been like beyond seven sigma confidence and is still not able to predict the observational data there has no been that has not been any observational data uh, proving for the whatever the things that was predicted by the standard model of cosmology and and mond has been like proven for more than five sigma confidence now if i want to give you an example that how do i know if this is true so basically if i talk about higgs boson higgs boson was predicted uh, beyond five sigma uh, confidence that's how it, it had been predicted and if you want to know more about this if you want to know more how did the falsification happen uh, how uh, sorry how the falsification how to prove this uh here is the lecture on the same it is uh, by the by the professor himself pavel krupa you can totally see it it is i highly recommend this it is a really nice explanation moving on so thank you very much and these are the references that i took and there is like this reference about the debates as well on the lcdm and uh the mond there are two debates and i would like to thank you everyone for uh present uh, for being present in my for listening to my presentation and i would now continue to for uh, for sorry for advait now thank you yeah thank you advait so hello everyone so this is advait joshi and today i am going to speak about the tuli feature uh, relation so uh, till now we have learned what is lambda cdm model how good is lambda cdm model why it fails and where it fails we have also understood how perfect is mond and to add some toppings on the perfectness of mond we have this tuli fisher relation so brent tuli and richard fisher when they studied the spin flip radiation of the spiral galaxies they got a very precise and empirical relationship between the mass or the intrinsic luminosity of a spiral galaxy and its asymptotic rotation velocity or emission line width or the 21 cm line they were also very clear in predicting the approximate accurate value of the hubble's constant so uh, what was the relationship it stated that luminosity of a galaxy is directly proportional to the velocity to the power 4 now uh, next slide please 
yeah so when we study pulifisher relation with the help of newtonian dynamics we come to see that in newtonian dynamics we have the point that velocity square is directly proportional to gm by r so as we require velocity to the power 4 we square the velocity term and we have v square is equals to gm whole square by r square you can also see the average surface brightness which is given by the symbol of sigma and below that the galaxy luminosity l which is given by pi r square sigma so replacing the r square term from galaxy luminosity we have a new relationship excluding the constants and it states that velocity to the power 4 is proportional to m square sigma by l square multiplied by l so uh, as we know that uh, in newtonian regime that the masses don't play a big role so for for the mass part it goes constant for everywhere but when we study the mean surface brightness or the average surface brightness we come to know that for the there are two types of galaxies high surface brightness galaxies and low surface brightness galaxies so here the role comes and according to newtonian dynamics there should be two types of tulipish relations one for the high surface brightness and one for the low surface brightness whereas excluding the mass term so next slide please yeah so uh, in this two pictures you can see on the left side we have the high surface brightness the hsb galaxies and here we have the low surface brightness galaxies uh, so for the mean surface brightness as we can see in the picture itself they are different moving forward uh, testing the tolly fisher relation with mod as we know as our friend with which said about the a not value and as we know uh, adding that value in the formula and when we make the equation for the velocity to the power 4 we get the term as m by l into l and as we take the m by l ratio constant or to be as tau as it is obviously constant in all the galaxies whether you take the newtonian regime or the mond regime it rarely varies from uh, 1 to or 3 or it may be like 0.5 something so it has a constant value but the main part is of the surface brightness which gets eliminated here in the mond so for this then we don't need to have any two types of relationships for high surface brightness galaxies and the low surface brightness galaxies and this was a very major proof and this actually proved that a uh, mond using the mond tully fisher relation is gets universal and so mond is, is a perfect prediction now going forward yeah so when uh, as we discuss about the surface brightness so when the modehi milgram sir proposed the mond theory and just 10 years later when people started to get the data for the low surface brightness it actually was correct and this indeed proved us that the tully fisher relation between the mass and velocity was as indeed predicted by mond and so like this is a very nice proof for mond and saying that dark matter doesn't exist so for there are nice research articles which are mentioned in the reference over here now moving forward to the work which we guys are going to do in the coming future and the problems with, and the proofs which we guys are going to prove which are also called as limitations of mond for now the first limitation on which we guys are working are going to work in the future is like mond explains the motions of stars within the galaxy but somehow it fails to explain the motions of clusters of the galaxy like for example if you take the bullet cluster one so we know that the most of the mass is located in the purple area and this is evident to us by the gravitational lensing and this is how like uh, somehow we can't remove the possibility of the existence of dark matter then moving forward to have some more problem statements for us there is another problem which is the cmb so the cosmic macro background tells us a lot about the nucleosynthesis and from the einstein and the friedman equation we can estimate that the universe has about 5% of the ordinary mass but for having a flat universe that we actually got 30% of critical matter which we don't have like so there are a lot of unknowns in the universe but the concept of dark matter for now actually remains a known unknown now i would like to uh, travel this whole journey to my friend sanat okay um so am i audible yes you are yeah okay So I'll be talking about these four galaxies. Uh, these galaxies are like uh, exceptions. 
this currency don't even obey LCDM and also they don't even obey the mod. So I'll start with the Messiah 94. Uh, Mesa, you can see the rotation curve of this galaxy. And uh, this galaxy, is, uh, this one is the rotation curve and this is the Kepler mass function. And uh, for normal galaxies, uh, which have a normal amount of dark matter in it, the uh, rotation curve increases or sometimes it stays constant. But you can see that the rotation curve, are, uh, like as you go beyond the center of the galaxy, it is decreasing. And uh, I can, by, like, by, saying, uh, by seeing this gra uh, graph, you can say that uh, this galaxy may have less dark matter compared to other galaxies. So we can consider this galaxy as an exception. But we cannot say that this galaxy lacks dark matter, but yeah, it should have a little less amount of dark matter compared to other galaxies. Now, but the next three galaxies are mysterious, as I uh, showed, showed before. Uh, this galaxy is uh, Dragonfly 44. It was discovered by Dragonf uh, Dragonfly Telephoto Array. Uh, this is the tele telescope. And uh, this is the ult ultra diffuse galaxy. These uh, ultra diffuse galaxies are a class of galaxies which are really faint and they are like widespread. And uh, these galaxies sometimes uh, show no evidence of rotations. And uh, these galaxies have low luminosity and they're really old galaxies. And uh, this, it, this galaxy was at uh, 326 million light years away. And this galaxy has mass equal to the mass of uh, Milky Way, but it emits only 1% of that Milky Way emits. So you can see that uh, total ma mass of Dragonfly 44 is same as the Milky Way. But uh, the star mass is 1%. Uh, like if you roughly, you can say that it's just 1%. The luminosity of this galaxy is 1%. So by seeing this, by uh, calculating the lum luminous mass, which includes the uh, radio like in dust, which is can, which can be found from radio, hot and cold gases from IR, and uh, stars, which is uh, found by IR through visible, and dynamical mass. This mass is uh, the mass which is uh, invisible, which can be found by the motions of uh, globular clusters to see the effects of black holes and dark matter. And uh, the, after finding the luminous mass and dynamic mass, the luminous mass was like really less and uh, the dynamic mass was like uh, really more. We can see that there are uh, 90 to 100 globular clusters in this galaxy. So by this, we can conclude that uh, what they concluded was that uh, this galaxy had 99% of dark matter, which is uh, totally new to us. Like we had never heard that. And uh, it is weird too. So that, that's why I added this into the mysterious galaxy classes. And uh, this is another UDG, uh, ultra diffuse ga galaxy in the constellation Cetus. This was early, uh, early ca calculated that it was uh, 62 million light years away. And uh, this, uh, this galaxy is a luminous mass and dynamical mass, which I uh, spoke before was almost equal. Then, like if luminous mass that is visible mass and invisible mass are equal, then that, you know, predicts that this galaxy doesn't have dark matter at all. But uh, later again, the another team, you know, did a study on this galaxy. And after doing that, they found that this galaxy was uh, 42 million light years away, which is, it changed everything now. Uh, so it was pro proposed that this galaxy, it's uh, it's a normal galaxy with normal amount of dark matter, matter in it. But it's still it's trouble because uh, we saw Dragonfly 44, which had 99% of dark matter, and it is an ultra diffuse galaxy. And same class of galaxy, we have normal amount of dark matter. Like how, how did it have normal amount of dark matter? Because it was closer. If it was closer, then the, lum the luminous luminosity was less of the calculation. So they found that this galaxy had normal amount of dark matter. But another galaxy, say in the same group of uh, NGC 1052, you, uh, this uh, NGC 1052 is a galaxy, and uh, it's, there's a group of the galaxy between it, uh, uh, among it. And they found uh, DF4 in 2019, and uh, it was similar. The properties were similar, like uh, like the similar when it was at uh, 62 million light years away. That what they found, and uh, the same thing. This also lacks dark matter, and it was 63 million light years away. The studies are currently going on on this galaxy because it was uh, discovered recently. And uh, by seeing these galaxies, uh, we can say that uh, Dragonfly 44 has 99% of dark matter, and uh, uh, DF4, DF2 has a normal amount of dark matter. DF4 has a uh, less dark matter. So this is like trouble for both LCDM and MOND. First thing, uh, trouble for MOND is because these galaxies, as their 
really diffuse uh, the galaxies, the, the global cultures maybe, or uh, even the stars are not uh, gravitationally bound to the galaxy sometimes. So they don't uh, show evidence of rotation. And also uh, LCDM can't explain it because how can the same class of galaxies have different amount of dark matter in it? So this was troubleful for the, uh, both models. So it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's like limitations of both LCDM and MOND, these galaxies are. So next thing is uh, dark matter superfluidity. So before going to our dark matter superfluidity, I'll uh, just talk about superfluidity. Superfluidity is a state of matter where uh, fluid has zero viscosity. It happens, it happens when you cool, uh, cool it to like uh, near zero temperature, and uh, it occurs in uh, helium three and helium four isotopes. When it happens, the helium atoms are don't act like a uh, independent uh, molecules or uh, atoms, but they act as uh, unison. I means like. They are together. The whole body is coordinated as a single body, or like you know, a parade like that. They are so disciplined, I could say. And uh, this uh, this process is similar to uh, superconductors. And uh, this phenomenon is comparable to both Einstein condensate, but uh, it's not. Like, the phenomenon is comparable, but you cannot say that. Uh, Every superfluid is a Bose-Einstein condensate, and every Bose-Einstein condensate is a superfluid. Uh, so I'll show a video of uh, helium superfluid. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating medium with helium cool until it turns absolute zero. A dramatic transformation. You can see uh, now it is a superfluid. It's stable. You see that the bubbling stops and at the surface of the liquid helium it's completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now. Nothing is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine bronze. Ordinarily, this contained the tiny pores can hold the liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of soul a superfluid. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its containment. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Okay, so now this was the dark matter um, superfluidity, and. Uh... So now I'll talk about uh, dark matter superfluidity. Uh, dark matter superfluidity is trying to, like the, this theory is trying to explain both LCD mo uh, model and also the MOND phenomenology. Uh, like in this meme, we can see that uh, LCDM and MOND are like quarreling with each other and dark matter superfluidity is like planning to bring these uh, two different people together because uh, these these people know like I don't I want to say it but they like hate each other they don't accept your know, whatever they uh, each other say so dark matter superfluidity was a approach to bring these people together this theory was published by uh, Bezani and Corey and they pointed out that the mathematical structure of mod and superfluidity was similar uh, by looking at the so mathematical structure of both mod and superfluidity they, they thought that maybe uh, dark matter exists in a superfluid phase uh, so uh, the condition uh, conditions for uh, dark matter to condensate into superfluidity. First thing that uh, dark matter particle cannot be WIMPs. In this case, it cannot be WIMPs because uh, WIMP particles have a, a more la massive than the other particles. We can consider axions here, and uh, the mass should be equal or uh, lesser than or approximately equal to two electron volt. If uh, and uh, you can see this graph. And the area below this curve, uh, we can have both Einstein condensate, that is superfluidity, and uh, above this curve, normal dark matter. 
and uh, 10 power 12 is the like 10 power 12 to 13 is the range of the galaxy mass of the galaxies and uh, this this range is above uh, like galactic clusters and we can see that at two we can see this little here uh, the galaxy's mass will be equal to the uh, mass of a two electron volt of a dark matter particle and uh, the de Broglie wavelength uh, what happens is when you cool the dark matter particle uh, at uh, the temperature, the cricket, critical temperature from this equation, we got it is uh, 0 0.2 millikelvin, which is the bottom of the slide. And you can see uh, at that temperature, uh, the de Broglie wavelength, as you cool down, the, the velocity decreases of the dark matter and the wavelength increases. As wavelength increases, they overlap with each other. At each particle's wavelength overlaps with each other. And after overlapping, they become a unison, as I uh, told before. So these particles act as a single body. And uh, after uh, having this uh, single body, uh, they, they, uh, I'll, I'll tell what happens after that. And yeah, after uh, becoming a single body, they will uh, mediate a force called phonons, which will be explained more by uh, case. And uh, this is the ratio of uh, dark matter condensate and the normal dark matter. And uh, here it is one at 10 power 12, uh, the 11 to 12. This is the range of a uh, galaxy. And it is one because uh, uh, at galactic levels, dark matter is condensed as superfluid. As you increase the mass, and uh, if, if you also you increase the mass of, uh, if you see the mass of the individual dark matter particle, the mass uh, increases. And uh, the dark matter, ma the, the galactic cluster mass lies here. And you can see that it is approaching zero. That, that means that uh, in gal galactic clusters, uh, it may be the, uh, the dark matter exists in a superfluid phase or in a normal phase. So in galaxies, almost condensed into a superfluid phase, but uh, in galaxies, galaxy clusters, they in a uh, mix or normal phase. So next part will be explained by uh, Rishikesh. Yeah, thank you, Sanat. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks for the confirmation. And hello, guys. This is uh, Rishikesh. And guess what? We are in the end game now. <laughs> uh, so, as Sapli explained earlier, uh, my son, uh, could we have both the phases, uh, both as the normal fluid as a sup and as a superfluid, as uh, proposed by Dr. Kauri and Dr. Berziani? Uh, that's what you're going to uh, explain in the next slides. Next slide, please. Um, the proposed study has the following probable phase properties, which uh, primor primordially intends that the normal phase is uh, ideated to be existing at a high gradient of temperature and would act like uh, the conventional ideated particle dark matter or uh, in a more uh, humoristic fashion, uh, the phenomenon of superflu superfluidity on steroids. <laughs> That's how it's intended. And uh, coming with the case of the superfluid phase, it is ideated to exist at a low temperature gradient. And uh, that's an interesting property here. Uh, phonons, which was uh, mentioned by Sanat earlier, are uh, one of the primordial concept, which most of you guys could be knowing. Uh, they start to exhibit properties like the intended modified uh, gravity, which is the brainchild of uh, Dr. Eric Verlinde. And one more added advantage of this ascertained model is that uh, it kicks out the need for an interpolation attributes, which is again advantageous uh, since we want lesser calculations and more of results. Next slide, please. Yeah. So what is this modified gravity? Uh, well, in simple terms, modified gravity is built such that uh, Gravity is described more uh, like a tensor synergy reactional attribute, or which is like, like described as a secondary property over a primordial uh, matter or something which is influencing it. And which is again advantageous since it could follow a lot of uh, nodes, which is uh, put forth by all the problems you are solving. And this is the simplified uh, thought of the entire equation. I just wanted to make it math free since you guys have sat through a long lecture by now. Uh, I just wanted to make it math free and more uh, conceptual. Next slide, please. Um, interesting advantage here in the case of superfluid dark matter, 
is that the gax uh, galaxy lensing you heard it right the gravitational lensing thing and we people were ideating uh, lensing in blank space imagine we are just ideating the phenomenon of lensing in blank space and so how about the thought of a uh, superfluid lens sounds more interesting right uh, this was the first thought which occurred when we thought about the superfluid phase but uh, there's a general issue here a uh, conventional lensing uh, which uh, is studied would have a lesser intensity uh, in the case of a superfluid filter which is probably due to the expected um, uh, reaction interaction uh, between the medium and the mode but uh, but this issue could be could be sorted out uh, with the observation of stronger counterparts which uh, is nothing but just stronger gravitational waves caused by galactic cores uh, this is one potent opportunity in the case of uh, superfluid dark matter next slide please um there are other few ways to to determine the superfluid dark matters the first probable one is to look for particles in local experiments which are carried out right on earth but uh, doing some guessing work here it would be very difficult to actually measure something which is uh, feasible to calculations it would be too weak so going to the second option uh, there is one quote which is commonly said uh, the detail uh, the devil lies in the detail <laughs> which could be applied to this case too and there's an expectation of uh, any mark which is left by the phase transition between the normal and the superfluid state by the superfluid dark matter but again uh, we have to solve sort of a lot of things to actually find this thing and this will be requiring uh, large scale simulations and this is not feasible for the current stage too and the third option which could is that uh, if the superfluids which are ideated would probably collide they could uh, cause an interference pattern the problem again is that the current observation data couldn't resolve such structures so in tot uh, for the current time being it's not a good time for the superfluidists who are ideating on this concept so if you are better interested in the dark matter superfluidity better make a time machine first and don't uh, mess up with your grand uh, grandfather which could cause a larger problem in the entire space time continuum uh fun apart <laughs> this is the current situation of the superfluid dark matter testing but as a probable opportunity in the near future scope next slide please and in summary which i wish to put out here is that the two phase system which i explained here has a very synergial mode to combine both the modified gravity and the cold dark matter case which is very advantageous and could better join both the uh, warring parties and bring with more uh, results this is one uh, probable case uh, which is well motivated and uh, makes testable predictions in near future too and is driven by a group of researchers spread across the world right now after a very long phase of too much uh, gray matter cracking we are just getting a little bit close to the riddle which is over 8 decades old now and yeah this is the summary in tot the next slide thank you guys and signing off in behalf of my team i guess we did a great job we expect for your opinions and i thank on behalf of my team for the the nakshatra team and it was a really wonderful experience personally as well as in form of the team i had a really wonderful team and i personally also thank uh, sanat he was very he got a, he became a bro to be more specific and let the star wars uh, finale team start playing thank you guys have a good night yeah thank you rishikesh and uh, we have done with uh, equinox now but it's not over here we can have more of equinox and uh, sanat the finale team would be better i guess for that situation he started yeah. with one <laughs> yeah you could end with one okay so can uh, if anybody has doubts you can uh, ask great okay can can you cast doubts if no doubts then we can end the session any doubts guys we could we are ready to answer your uh, queries and yeah thank you sagarika for helping us out and giving us the guidance throughout this pro journey and uh, thank you everyone of my team all the cohort leaders and even uh, uh, the admins of equinox thank you very much
Yeah, thank you for yeah, that as well. Yeah. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Equinox. Thank you to our cohort mentor. Uh,